If we want to create engagement in the classroom of the future, then what is it we have to do? I was part of a panel at Bahrain's Education Project, October 8th to 10th in 2010. And the panel was trying to answer this question, whether we manage to or not is another question. I wanted to pick not on quite so much on the digital technology side of things, but something that I feel is just as important. If we have seven spaces that we could define in the digital world, and this idea was really started a couple of years back by my former colleague Matt Locke uh, at Channel 4 when he came up with six spaces. Uh, six spaces where we interact with technology and interact with people through that technology in different ways. Then I wonder what would happen if we took that digital life and superimposed it upon the learning spaces that we are renovating, rebuilding and constructing for the first time. A learning space might be in a school, but equally it might be a company looking at how it builds its company headquarters to enable better collaboration and also better work of individuals. So let's have a look through these seven spaces and see how could we harness them to make a more compelling classroom of the future. First of all, secret spaces, which in technology terms include things like text messaging, instant messenger, and even the picto chat function within the Nintendo DS games console. They are secret spaces because you communicate one person to one other person, generally speaking. And that notion of secret spaces is, I think, in schools, generally not accepted and certainly not harnessed. One type of secret type space is in the chair in a classroom. Quite often when you're working alone, um, you don't really have space for <clears throat> getting off task. And getting off task is incredibly powerful to discover new ideas, see tangents you otherwise wouldn't have explored. Explore with other people very quickly, maybe with the person next to you, what it is you're doing. But in a traditional classroom layout with rows of seats laid out, and even as a group of four, generally the tables are, are too, they push the learner too far apart to be able to have a meaningful conversation. What ends up happening is a kind of awkward type of sharing. And The Third Teacher, a wonderful book uh, all about learning spaces, has one of its lessons as make peace with fidgeting. And I think we have some physical tools that would allow us to take advantage of this fidgeting, if you like, and make it part of communicating in a secret space kind of way. With these hokey stools from VS Furniture, you're almost encouraged to swivel and swing. And I think it's almost like a, an encourager of those kinds of conversations that begin, have you seen this? For youngsters in a classroom, it would allow them to very quickly and easily have one of those kind of secret conversations with their peers in order to move on their learning or move on their project. Another type of secret space um, is quite a literal one. When uh, Gaver Tully and his tinkering school were set with the challenge of experiments in the future of reading, these are the kinds of niches that his students constructed. Little houses on stilts almost that they constructed in order to have a place where they could read in quiet, alone, without distraction. And what you end up with are are fantastic secret spaces where in one moment, as you can see on the left hand side here, you're able to hide away and get on with whatever thinking, whatever writing, whatever kind of personal task you want to do. And in the next, as you can see in the right, you can very quickly have a conversation with someone to check your ideas, to, to see whether or not um, what you're, you're going down, the line of inquiry you're thinking of looking at is worthwhile. We need to make that secret space easy enough to have and in school at the moment we just tend not to have it. We do tend to try to have group spaces and in technology terms group spaces would include Facebook and also social games like Farmville and they're dependent on tools within the tool with features within the tool leading to only one thing which in Facebook's terms is bring a friend along, make a friend become a member of Facebook, add your existing friends to this virtual group space online. And in physical spaces, there's huge scope 
for using the community, using the groups around us as designers of our physical space. A key example of that would be at Stanford University's D School, where effectively you have a very cheap, very bare space with plenty of furniture, plenty of artificial spaces, all on wheels, all very manipulatable. And um, throughout the, the school, the entire space is designed to be built uh, on a, on a just-in-time basis and to be built around the groups that we naturally tend to form when we're tackling a difficult challenge. Let's take a look at some of those spaces. For example, you need dynamic objects in order to create dynamic spaces. And in this particular room at the D-School, if you needed a secret space or if you needed a discussion area or if you needed to move from one to another, You'd be able to do it very quickly simply by taking these Lego brick chairs, these Lego brick type uh, modular furniture and stacking them on each other or constructing a little wall for yourself to hide away in. So if you need a secret space or if you need a discussion area, you would just go and build one. There are also the, the need to, to take a group and separate it from other groups within a classroom. Traditional classrooms just don't allow you to do that. You have one open plan learning space and if you're a small group within it, you just have to compete to hear each other. You have to compete by making more noise. It's really quite destructive to group work for that. Here you've got um, walls that if you want them, you just pick them up and hang them on the rails that are on the ceiling. You can have one with holes, you can make a solid wall. They're ready to hang and to create those different kinds of spaces that we all require. Publishing spaces are also rather interesting. Publishing spaces include the blog, uh, the Flickr account where you publish your photographs or photo bucket. You throw something up online so that people can hopefully find it. And that's how all these technologies work. Uh, they occasionally tap into group spaces, but otherwise we're all about taking something, showing it to the world and hoping that they will become part of our community. Now imagine if we took that same idea and applied it to learning. The one thing I noticed in the Middle East, for example, is how grand the building's window spaces are. And imagine if we just took that at the end of the day and published the best thing our students had created that day and projected it out onto those windows for the rest of the world to see. That's the kind of perhaps 1990s, early 2000s solution. And it's a great one. But how about this? Here is a video, and it's a video that shows how the tweets, the Twitter messages from within an office block can be projected onto its wall and therefore show people passing by, in this case commuters, what's going on inside the building. Take a look and have a think about how this kind of open air learning, this augmented reality uh, demonstration, publishing of learning, could make your school space that little bit more interesting. <laughs> Pockets hums a heavy song. Even the bird sounds hoarse. And the clouds flies with only one wing. And your dream smells slightly like the ashes lying in any other. Where the pockets empty or full. And another lesson, I think, from the third teacher is that this space that we create, whether it's virtual, the kind you've just seen, or the very physical nature of our schools, I think schools really can be the community's best neighbour. How could we design our space so that it's not just used from 9am to 4pm, but it's used by everyone in the community all the time and really taken advantage of? Let's move into performance spaces. The thing about performance spaces in technology terms is that they allow people to be something they're not. In World of Warcraft, you can be a warlord or a warlock. In video games, you can take on the persona of whoever it is you're playing. But in space, in physical space within a learning environment, that looks very different. For example, play occurs in more than just playgrounds. This particular school in Japan is a nursery school. These are three, four and five year olds who instead of using the traditional means of getting from one level of the school to another, 
use a playful means. They use the netting to scramble around, have fun and navigate their way to their next classroom. They're able to perform. They're able to enjoy uh, being people they're not as they run, fall and tumble from one space to another. We also have participation spaces. And in schools, these are hard to come by in traditional buildings, but you do see them increasingly often. In technology terms, participation spaces often include these kind of live web events. They can include markets, trading sites such as eBay. In a physical world, though, I think these are places where the theory we teach youngsters is made practice. Gaver Tully's Tinkering School is probably one of the best examples where theory is turned to practice on a regular basis. Gaver talks about tilting the project towards completion, and that means that instead of having a focal point at the front of the classroom where a teacher teaches theory, there are a million focal points where youngsters make things, construct things, where they trade ideas, where they trade techniques in order to achieve what it is they want to build. Whether it's a boat or a roller coaster, these children are constantly learning from each other through a kind of learning commons, through participation spaces where you need to participate in order to learn. We also have data spaces, and in technology terms, these have exploded really in the last year or so, and that's what led me to add it to Matt's original six spaces. Data.gov.uk, the Sunshine Foundation, the Guardian Data Bank, they're all spaces where people both view data, they suck data down, and using that data, they produce new angles, new stories that perhaps we hadn't thought of before. Now, how could real-time data on the life of a school be used to improve it? One such example might come from just round the road, round the corner from me at Gullen Primary School. I visited there a couple of years ago now and was really astonished by the way that they were creating their own energy, both solar and wind energy. What I was wondering though is how could we take these digital readouts and put them in every area of the school so that when we turn a light switch off, we're immediately aware of what it is we're saving. When we turn it on, we're aware of how much energy we're consuming compared to what we are actually producing ourselves. And that simple addition subtraction won't happen, can't really happen, unless we have that data provided at every tangible point of our school day. Finally, we have watching spaces. Watching spaces in technology terms are lectures, television. I think the TED Talks have shown there is a huge appetite still for watching spaces. When we have a brilliant lecture, there's nothing quite like it. The idea of having activities in a different space every day, again, permeates a lot of thinking around some, some progressive pedagogy and certainly in the third teacher as, a, as an architectural tool. Imagine a lecture not taking place in a classroom, but taking place in an amphitheatre designed for just that purpose. All of a sudden you would find fewer lectures taking place from teachers, given that they have to move everyone to a specific spot to give it. But I think you would also find much better lectures, ones that really engage the learner in ways that haven't happened before. And if you take a look again at the Stanford D School room that we looked at earlier on, the rooms here have three focal points. Collaboration during listening is encouraged. All the furniture is on wheels. And as you can see, there's plenty of sofa space. So it's encouraged to whisper, to have those secret moments, if you like, during a lecture. But with three focal points, the lecture is almost discouraged. Um, and if it is a lecture, it's certainly not just from the teacher in the room. The lecture could come from anyone, given that there isn't a teacher's desk in front of the podium. Uh, there are merely spaces where you can talk to groups. For me, these are just ingredients and just a starting point really in how we might create engagement in the classroom of the future. It's part of the recipe book, if you like. It's one set of ingredients as our good friend and huge uh, enthusiast and propagator of great ideas of education spaces, Stephen Heppel might put it. I'm going to be developing these ideas as I have been with schools and education districts for the past six months and I'll be developing them over on my blog edu.blogs.com. I do hope that you can pop over there and join in the discussion. Thanks for listening.